here, there is a sort of a tent. There is a complete separation of the capsule from the cortex. It has a beautiful advantage. You can go here through this tent and perform hydrodisection. In this case, the irrigation aspiration is gonna be very easy and it's gonna take just a few seconds. And you, you just go in and never out until you finish irrigation aspiration. And look here, after irrigation aspiration, the, the zonules are still intact, indicating what? Indicating that there was no movement during irrigation aspiration and vitreous didn't prolapse during irrigation aspiration, which lowered the incidence of retinal detachment in the future. And you can easily go in and eat the capsular bag with a cutter and here at conclusion of surgery. Here and I, even without zonular attachment, there is only here zonular attachment peripherally. And there is a long standing, can you see here from three to six o'clock position, there is peripheral anterior synechia. In these cases, how can you go for anterior rexis? With a micro rexis forceps, you push in a direction parallel to the subluxation, push, 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 and then you complete in the conventional way. With a Y-shaped cannula here, you push the rexes towards the hook to facilitate hooking of the anterior rexes and then complete the surgery. This is the beautiful tent where you can go for hydrodissection. And then once in for irrigation aspiration here, after irrigation aspiration, despite you have a, an area of zonular dehiscence, there is no vitreous prolapse and then you complete the surgery in the usual way. Um, if the subluxation is downward, you use a Sinsky hook or a dialer to pull the rexis to facilitate the hooking and centralization of the lens. And if the subluxation is upward of the lens, you use a Y-shaped spatula like this one and you push the rexis towards the hook to facilitate hooking and then continue the surgery, irrigation aspiration, and here at conclusion of surgery. One more step, one more thing about the surgery. Even if you have a large microsphere fascia like that, even if you have these beautiful zonules, don't ever leave to cap um, think to leave the capsular bag. You have, after, after finishing irrigation aspiration, this is beautiful bag, don't leave it. You have to eat it up, all of it with a cutter and leave the eye aphakic like that without capsular support. Why? Because if there is a large microsphere fake, can you see this is the edge? And if you think to leave a beautiful anterior and posterior rexis here at conclusion of surgery, can you see this is the edge of the lens? What's gonna happen? Few months after surgery, complete fibrosis of the capsular bag, shrinkage of the capsular bag, and here elongation of the zonules. Why? Because the, cap the capsular bag, the zonules couldn't withstand the normal fibrosis of the capsular bag. They are originally um, diseased. Unlike the congenital cataract, here just few months or years after surgery, you have a beautiful capsular support. This is another eye. Can you see this is a microsphere of fascia? Here we left a beautiful anterior and posterior rexis here at conclusion of surgery. Few months after surgery, extensive fibrosis here and zonular uh, elongation obstructing the visual axis that we have to go again with a vitrectomy to clear the visual axis. And here at conclusion of surgery. After surgery, immediately we have a deep anterior chamber, and we fit the babies with aphakic spectacles. And in cases of older children, as in this case, having a dislocated anterior um, microsphilophakia and a subluxated one, we can implant um, iris glow lens as a secondary procedure. This is a case with a long standing pupillary here and here at conclusion of surgery, here immediately after surgery, before and few months after surgery, the left eye, the pressure was controlled and we were able to save the right eye. And of course, by examining routine exam of her brother, we found that he has the same condition 
appear immediately after surgery wearing the aphectic spectacles, and one year after surgery, he was glaucoma free. So finally to conclude, microsterophagia may present with high myopia, with a high astigmatism that is not amenable to be corrected by spectacles and it is embryogenic. It may present with anterior or posterior dislocation of the lens or may present with all varieties of pediatric glaucoma, congenital or acquired, primary or secondary. That's why it is considered as one of the pediatric ocular emergencies that had to be dealt immediately with bilateral lensectomy. And thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you, Dr. Michael, as usual, from Alexandria University. I am from Alexandria, so uh, excellent talk. I think we have a lot of questions, maybe from Aik Ahmed, from uh, Dr. Khan, but uh, time going on. So I, I have to shift for uh, Dr. Ammar Safa. Uh, hello, Dr. Ammar, Dr. Prasen. If you want anything, you are one of us. Uh, moderator. So, uh, so Dr. Amar will talk about 3D head up surgery in ophthalmology. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for um, the invitation. Um, I'm just uh, sharing my screen here in just a second. Can you see it? Okay. All right. I can see that you can see my screen, so I'm going to go ahead. Um, so uh, I have no right now. Feedback from uh, somebody. Can can you hear me? Your, uh, phone? Okay. So um, our uh, specialty is a uh, is a very uh, non tactile uh, specialty, if you will. So unfortunately, we are not uh, like uh, uh, internists who can actually, you know. Uh, palpate something or um, or put their finger or their hand on the patient and be able to uh, identify a problem. We depend so much on uh, actually visualization of uh, the internal parts of the eye. And for that, uh, over the, you know, several decades in the past, there's been major improvements starting with very simple things. And we made our way into uh, technology, improving uh, uh, our ability to visualize things and actually creating systems that allow us to uh, be able to see the structures inside of the AI in order to be able to do surgery, uh, including the you know, primary or uh, initial microscopes that were initially created. But even with the most advanced microscopes, you always have the issue of the surgeon having to kind of like position the head and, and uh, bend the neck like this, as you can see here, in order to see uh, what they're doing. Even with the, uh, you know, the, the up, most up-to-date uh, systems that we have right now uh, in the market. So basically what happened then with the, uh, you know, uh, technology improvement with the fact that now we have a, um, a digital revolution, if you will. Um, in 2008, True Vision Systems uh, introduced what they called a three-dimensional heads-up ophthalmic surgical visualization system, which basically consisted of a high-definition high display, a monitor, a camera that's uh, also uh, high-definition connected to that uh, uh, monitor, and a passive 3D uh, glasses. I'm sorry, just a second. I'm not able to control this very well. All right. Uh, Sony in 2012, 2013 entered the market with their own uh, heads up uh, system. It was mainly designed for neurosurgery, but they came up with an ophthalmology module. And this module, as you can see in the picture here, came with a headset. It wasn't glasses, it was just a headset, uh, as you can see. But unfortunately, the uptake wasn't really very good in the ophthalmic community for the system. Alcon acquired True Vision in 2016 and created the system that we currently call Ingenuity which is a visualization, a visualization uh, platform, which is specifically created and designed for ophthalmology for mainly vitro retinal surgery, but then also they branched out into anterior segment as we will have a talk about that later on today. So the system, uh, again, the idea is the same. You have three components trying to come up with an image that feeds into the uh, surgeon who is wearing the uh, 3D glasses. It is uh, basically a, a monitor that's large and very high uh, definition, 4,000 pixel monitor. Uh, and you have a 4,000 pixel camera that uh, improves the overall resolution and visualization. 
So here's basically the camera. It's an HDR camera that acquires this high resolution image. The, the good thing is it passes initially through a processor that basically elevates the intensity of the image, which so I'll show you some examples, and allows uh, the, for, for using a much dimmer amount of light in order for us to see what we need to see in order to operate and do our surgery. And obviously the uh, physician now has a 3D glasses that are comfortable that allow you to see 3D and 2D. So the idea is to take this image on your left that is good, high quality, but intensify it and, and improve the, uh, the resolution, the uh, vividness of the colors and uh, allow you to see a lot more detail. So if you look at this very pretty lady, you can actually see all the details in her mouth and her uh, eyes, but you really can't see much details in the background where the mountain and the greenery and the water. So what the system does is it improves the depth of field and make you see much better detail in all different layers. So the visualization becomes very important, especially with uh, uh, VR surgery, where you need to be focusing on one area while you're working, but at the same time uh, being able to see the entire picture. The uh, other advantage of this system is when you're working on the macula and trying to do some really fine work, you actually can have the macular hole, for example, as you can see on your right with the uh, uh, digital system, the whole uh, uh, monitor uh, shows you this one area that uh, you have very high detail, while the left side it shows you the normal image that you would see in a uh, normal microscope. Zeiss also introduced a couple of years ago uh, the Artivo system, which is their own uh, system uh, like the Ingenuity. It uses the same pretty much idea. It offers a little bit more compatibility because it is integrated within their own system, but unfortunately at the same time does not allow you to use any other microscope. So uh, that is a, a little bit of a limitation, but it basically has the same idea. It's a very uh, high resolution camera and it promises a high resolution image with outstanding depth of field and a dramatically reduced uh, uh, requirement for light intensity, gives you natural color, and also it has the ability for cloud connectivity for your backing up your surgery and, and saving them. So the real question is, is basically does, you know, from a clinical standpoint, does the three, uh, 3D uh, system or the heads up surgeries as we call it, the vitreo retina surgery, does it result in better visual outcomes? So is the patient seeing better, getting better outcomes from these surgeries versus the optical systems? And will there be a, a, any fewer or lower complication rates? Will the surgery be more efficient maybe, uh, reducing operating time, maybe reducing the turnover time? And uh, of obviously for us as surgeons, will it be ergonomically better, more comfortable, and hopefully uh, uh, we can retire more comfortably? So multiple retrospective and prospective uh, studies have been uh, done to look into these questions. And basically all of them um, concluded that basically you have a similar outcome from, from a success standpoint, from a visual standpoint. It's similar, but not better than the uh, uh, optical system um, in performing at least uh, complex vitro retina surgeries. There is no increased rate of complications, but no decreased rate of complication at the same time. There's no conclusive data of any increased efficiency. And if you ask me, at least in the first month or two, the efficiency decreases, not increases because of the bulkiness of the equipment and the uh, ability to move it in and out. And uh, most studies report subjective uh, uh, preference, let's say from the staff and, and from the surgeons who are using the heads up. So let me now just spend the rest of my time telling you about my personal experience with uh, the digital systems. So the, the issue of seeing multiple levels, I think is very important. As you can see here, I'm shaving the uh, anterior uh, vitreous with this uh, retinal detachment. And so this is a great case to illustrate that because you have three layers. You can see where I'm shaving, you can see the detached retina, and you also can see the posterior pole and the, uh, um, and the optic nerve quite well in this video. Also, it illustrates very well how you can see all these layers. So this, I think is a, uh, in my opinion, an advantage that I noticed when I use this system. Here I'm uh, trying to um, remove the subretinal fluid in this detachment case, and you can see how beautifully you can see the the fluid getting out of the uh, of the hole. You can you can again see the retina where you're working and the posterior port in a very very good uh, resolution. This is a case where you can see the PVD coming up really nicely there. Uh, this is a patient who had a uh, pre-retinal or sub-ILM actually memory. You can see that the PVD comes up, but the uh, blood uh, continues to be contained because it's underneath the ILM. Uh, and, and you can really uh, see the differences between these layers 
And after you um, uh, create a hole in the ILM, you actually can, can evacuate this blood. But the reason why I wanted to show you this video is this different in colors. You can see the brightness here in the red. This system allows for changing the uh, filters or the channels is uh, the way you call the color channel that gives you intensification of the colors where you can see blood a bit better. Uh, and this is where you can see these differences going back and forth from one to the other. This can be, you know, that can prove to be helpful in certain, uh, certain circumstances. So uh, after you clean, this also allows you to do a very careful, after you evacuate that blood, uh, gives you a, a very uh, good view and very good detailed view in order to be able to evacuate and, and basically vacuum out the, the blood and make sure that you evacuate everything. And this is the edge of the ILM, as you can see here in this case. The ability to see if you have an uh, OCT, uh, intraoperative OCT, and be able to actually magnify it and see it on a, a big screen TV, as opposed to looking through the oculars, I, I believe is a major advantage. You can move the uh, uh, scan and actually uh, locate it in any place you want. I believe this is one big advantage in my opinion, as rather looking at it in one of your oculars. So the advantages, if I want to summarize them, when you're looking or you're basically trying to focus on a much bigger 60 or even more inch uh, uh, high definition uh, monitor, this gives you a much larger operating field of view and it enhances the depth of field. Uh, this is very important in my opinion. It gives you a superior view when you're doing macular work, you're seeing very, very small details in what you're doing. And of course, like we just discussed and showed you on the video, they have a better intraoperative OCT imaging. The ability uh, to reduce illumination, in my opinion, is a major, major plus because you use pretty much 5% only intensification of the light, which can be processed and you get a much better uh, uh, illumination. And that, of course, reduces the ri risk of uh, toxicity to the retina. And of course, it's always good to have the engagement of your scrub nurse seeing exactly what you're doing as opposed to looking at the oculars or looking at a small uh, monitor next to you. The disadvantage is that so far we still have a need for this guy uh, who will be basically a dedicated pers person to control the functions, especially if, if you need to do any changes in the colors. Uh, this will potentially be uh, solved soon where you uh, with your foot pedal can actually get everything uh, taken care of. Um, and of course there is still that little bit of a lag very, very uh, small and it's been much, much improved than the uh, previous versions. But I feel that there still is a very small lag which you can easily overcome after you do a couple of cases. Uh, the display of parameters here has always been hyped up as a very important uh, feature, which I believe is useful. But in, on, in on honesty, for me, I don't really look at it that much. I still like to hear it uh, because I like to focus uh, on what I'm doing in the uh, uh, in the retina and really not look at where is my uh, vacuum or where is the, the uh, cut rate. I still like to have the engagement of the staff telling me uh, these things. And like way I showed you earlier, the, the color filters sometimes can actually offer some advantage as to visualizing the vitreous better uh, or uh, areas that have bleeding. So if the question is, are we there for, for prime time? Is it, is it ready for the, uh, the heads up system to be actually in every operating theater? Probably yes, I would say almost there, but I would, I'm getting a lot more uh, uh, positive with, with this uh, system than, than uh, the optical. But uh, definitely for the budding vitreo retinal surgeons that uh, will probably become uh, the, the stars of vitreo retinal surgery in the coming 15, 20 years, they're always sitting down uh, playing uh, video games, as you can see. And, and I think for them, it will be definitely the, the uh, system of choice compared to anything optical. They might actually look at us and, and feel that we are uh, really obsolete. And, and why did we, how did we ever do surgery looking through a microscope? Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Amar. I think I asked Dr. Passan because he's a bit retinal between us. So if you want to ask you any question, we have one minute. Dr. Uh, excellent, excellent. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, yes. We can excellent hear talk, uh, Dr. Amar. Um, my only issue is uh, when I use Ingenuity, I found uh, difficulty in visualizing the inferior and the superior retina. Because if you look at your images, you're able to see the nasal and the peripheral uh, retina very well. But the inferior and the superior, especially when you're going to the peripheral part of the retina, is a little difficult. Did you experience the same thing when you were operating on? The detachments if you have to do a vitreous based shaving, or do you find the same issue? 
Uh, no, actually, I have not. Um, and and um, I will pay attention again because I'm actually going to use it again the, in the coming month. But I really have, do not recall uh, specifically not being able to visualize a part of the retina. Um, so I'm not quite sure. Maybe the, maybe the tilting of the microscope uh, when you used it may have been an issue. One of the issues was the camera is a rectangular shaped camera. Mm -hmm. So what it does is, if you look at your images on the screen, you'll always see the nasal and peripheral as circular. Mm -hmm. and the superior and inferior are flat. Mm -hmm. so when you go to the periphery, when you're doing under, uh, say, you're using your microscope, you can actually tilt your eye and you can see it better. But you know, on the infinity, if you're going on high magnification, the inferior and the superior periphery become a little difficult. So that was my experience. I think maybe in the recent, the next generation of, of machines will probably have better cameras to help us out. But however, excellent talk, and I think that's our future. I, I look, I've I've um, I've started using the system back in 2015, and the change I've noticed over the years have been dramatic, really. No, um, yes. From 2016, probably around 2016 until now, the first generation until the recent generation, I think, has been a huge leap forward. And uh, I, you know, like everything uh, uh, digital, I think there will be uh, further advancement coming. True. Thank you, Dr. Parsen. Thank you, Dr. Ammar. Uh, my colleague and my friend beside me, he will talk about Dr. Hayat Khan, about ROP, about the visual rehabilitation after management of ROP from the medical and the surgical point of view. Please, Dr. Hayat. And thank you once again, QIC. Uh, organization for letting us present uh, this wonderful meeting and thank you all the audiences for being there. Um, I see Dr. Ike is sending nice messages and uh, I'll start with this interesting topic uh, about um, ROP with this case. So it's a very usual case that comes in uh, with our retinal colleagues with a 25 week or a premature baby landing up with ROP zone one stage two with the plus disease. And what happens, we would like to go in and we would like to bilaterally send in the patient for OR and then we injected uh, Lucentis at 35 weeks, which responded quite well. The same patient on the follow-ups developed recurrence only in one eye, that is the left eye. And with this re recurrence, we, they had to laser and once it was lasered, the uh, patient on their follow-ups was reasonably doing very well. And then suddenly COVID-19 COVID comes in and that's a very re real thing now we are dealing with how patients are lost sometimes. And the patient then uh, lands up uh, after seven months and when we do a cyclorefraction, as you can see there, uh, there is a huge anisometropia. The left eye has a huge uh, myopia. If you see the spherical equivalent is huge. And that further has caused left eye amblyopia and then an esotropia of that eye. So does it surprise us? What do we do about this? And I think that's what we're going to discuss in today's uh, presentation. So premature uh, patients with ROP, uh, they have a greater chance of all these uh, clinical scenarios, uh, not only, uh, it may be causing very simple refractive errors, but definitely they have a very major role in the long term for a successful treatment. And isometropic amblyopia, strabismus, cataract, glaucoma, late onset retinal detachment, vitreous hemorrhages, and so on. So I would put it as simple as what you see here in this uh, uh, picture. This is a relay run in which uh, there are two people in the same team. It would be even better if this is not a relay, if a single person is handling. But what happens when you have team and we want to have this race to achieve best visual outcome for the child, it has to be coordinated. And it's especially important when you have different teams working out, you have a retina team, and then you have a pediatric ophthalmology team, and sometimes the patients are not handed over properly. Sometimes they lose 
their follow-ups because of parents' issues, uh, sometimes because of uh, now recently the COVID issue, and that actually is the challenge that we have to see. So good referral system, a robust system of follow-up in which pediatric ophthalmologists get a chance to take over uh, as a good team and then finally get the best results. So globally, what we are doing about this, especially when we look at laser, which is the, uh, still the uh, hallmark of the treatment, uh, despite all the advancement in the screening and management, we still have ROP as a leading cause of blindness and uh, visual impairment worldwide. Now, this, uh, this reduces the morbidity, uh, but in terms of the structural outcome, but still there is limited uh, functional outcome, which is still a long way to be achieved. Now that we include myopia, and when we see high incidence of a myopia in these cases, uh, the prevalence can be as from zero to 16 persons as documented. And way back in the ETROP study, myopia prevalence was about 58% in severe ROP cases, but when they received a laser photocoagulation, the number went 70%. Now, severe lasered uh, ROP patients, uh, they have a rapid progression of myopia, so they have to be regularly followed, and that's where the role of whosoever is the pediatric ophthalmologist comes in. So what are the mechanisms? Of course, sometimes uh, we feel that it is the arrested anterior segment um, growth or disturbed retinal signaling. And what are the different parameters which are affected are increased lens thickness, steep corneal curvature, anterior chamber shallowing, and axial length lengthening, which all are hindrance to the emetropization uh, of the eye. And I think that is the key reason why myopia is um, so much a problem in these uh, children. Now, high myopia, of course, um, are related to the zone one uh, patients who have received lasered. They are more prone as compared to the ones who got the injections. Now, there are several documentation, as you can see, different reports. And they even found that the zone one disease itself is an independent risk factor. So not necessarily injection or uh, laser has, um, so it is quite a, like, a, we really don't know the exact, it needs a huge amount of data collection and uh, uh, regression studies to finalize where we are on this in terms of the magnitude and the occurrence. And uh, accordingly, we have to plan our strategy. So uh, Kumar uh, et al, they reported this in, in 2019 that high axial length is the cause of myopia and it's not the lenticular thickness. While earlier reports, they show that uh, higher lenticular thickness is also a contributing factor. So there is still actually a controversy in knowing the exact mechanism and definitely we need to have more studies to come up with a final answer to know exactly what's going on in this severe ROP cases and how do we have to go about and how we change our protocols. In terms of astigmatism and strabismus, if you see there again, um, you will see that they have a high prevalence of astigmatism with the laser patient of ROP. And uh, these eye uh, have, the lasered eye have um, high astigmatism and uh, Strabismus is also present in these cases. Now, one out of three cases uh, do land up with strabismus, and that is due to amblyopia and the associated refractive errors which do come in, especially if it is uh, unequal amount causing an isometropia. So, prematurity itself is an independent risk factor for strabismus cases. So again, we have to come up with further studies to know. Cataract, again, there is a big study which has been published uh, in uh, 2017, which talks about um, a large cohort out of which 28 eyes of 22 patients were studied, and 11 out of these 28 eyes had vision, which was, that's about 40%, had uh, 2200 vision. So there are cases which need attention, and uh, these patients, once they develop myopic shift, uh, whether they are 
uh, left pseudophagic or a phagic, and the patients who are a phagic, they come up with a higher amount of myopia. So early identification, regular assessment, and prompt intervention is the key, and it's always uh, a mixture of refractive errors, emblyopia, and strabismus which go along. So screening programs have to be created, awareness have to be created, and of course, the long-term prospective control studies have to be taken up to understand the mechanism of myopia and the development and its progression. Now, sensory outcomes have also been an uh, important aspect that we have to look in, especially the fine stereopsis, the gross stereopsis. Uh, there are not much of a substantial literature which uh, document these and the, to validate as where we are in terms of these patients. But definitely in future, we would like to have more papers coming up which uh, elaborate on this. So premature babies, uh, they may have delayed visual maturation, they may have inability to see and recognition uh, at the level of brain. And of course, optic atrophy, blindness due to cerebral palsy and other comorbidities. So therefore, they need a lifelong periodic eye examination. So I'm quickly going to go on to this important paper published this year by um, Yen and Chen, in which they have actually looked in very carefully into the um, structural um, uh, the, the, the structure as well as uh, the different parameters of refraction, the optical biometry in children with ROP and who had gone through uh, the uh, anti-VEGF injections or laser. And there are 47 eyes of 24 ch 25 children which were studied and what they found something really interesting, especially when they looked into um, the the ROP patients comparing both of them. So if you see on the right side, you have the laser dyes, their, uh, their retina, and on the left side, you have the, uh, the patients with injections. And what we see on the OCT angiography is that the, the superficial capillary plexus uh, in the lasered uh, eye, they are uh, comparatively, um, if you see there, they have smaller amount as compared to the uh, the ones which are from the injection. So the FSZ is uh, is actually smaller, and if you see the vessel density, the laser group has significantly high at the fovea, but it is lower at the perifovea as compared to the injection group. Now, in terms of the uh, spectral domain or OCT that you see below. You see the thicker central foveal thickness with a prominent inner retina in laser group. And these all show that right at the very structural level, there are differences. And that is causing functional changes. And then going into the different biometric parameters, if you see there, again, uh, you, you come up that the average keratometry, there it is higher in laser group. The anterior chamber depth is shallower. The um, the axial length is definitely um, higher, and of course, also the lens thickness is thicker. So the, uh, um, finally, this concluded that we need to do further studies and have a further ground on how these ROP cases have to be dealt. Now, this is again, and there are a lot of papers on this and a lot of publications regarding myopia and their association with this disease. And of course, last but not the least, we have to talk about the, the beat ROP study group in which uh, the refraction was available for 109 patients. And what they found was that high myopia was more prevalent in cases of laser as compared to injection in zone one as well as in the zone two disease. And the anterior segment development was different in both these groups. So um, I'm not going much into the details, but what I would say, it's a cricket season. So I always say that it's not over till the last ball. And the take home message is the lack of screening and treatment can render a baby blind. And it is all a non-phenomena that's unlike any other disease. 
and vision training is an essential part of a good ROP management. And thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Hen. I think we will have a lot of questions in this because you give uh, uh, Lucentis. Uh, we have a lot of uh, preterm, maybe we are examining a lot in our hospital. From our experience, uh, we give Avastin, Avastin giving better result with us than uh, Lucentis. Maybe after that, we can talk about that. Uh, if it is a risk difference in this, or uh, to be repeated or no, also we can talk about that, but not now. I think uh, if we have time, we'll go for all these questions. I think we have to move for uh, Dr. Hassan Khalid. Dr. Hassan, oh. how are you? I'm and good, we'll thank go you. Again for, uh, for 3G head up surgery, but in Qatar yeah. now, not with uh, yes. we are going to... Okay, uh, thank you. Do you hear me? Uh, uh, firstly, I would like to thank Dr. Muhammad Al-Amri for his kind invitation for this big conference. Here I'm going to talk about the 3D heads up in cataract surgery, mainly in phaco emulsification. In traditional surgery, um, microsurgery using the uh, binocular microscope can lead to deleterious neck and back posture that cause um, musculoskeletal fatigue and injury, which has been associated with reduced surgical longevity, and uh, it's found that the prevalence of uh, neck, upper body, or lower back symptoms among ophthalmologists has been reported in up to 62%. Uh, in heads up surgery, uh, in cataract surgery, uh, this term described that uh, using the microsurgical procedure not by looking at the eyepieces of the microscope, but uh, by viewing the microscopic image on the penal uh, display sent front of the surgeon, uh, uh, sent from a 3D camera set in front of the surgeon. This heads up display system allows visualization in heads up position, as uh, it's clear in this uh, picture. Uh, and this uh, position eliminates the constraints imposed by the standard binocular microscope and minimizes the fatigue uh, by providing greater degree of freedom to operate in more natural physiologic position without affecting the image quality or technical uh, difficulty. There are two types, and there are also two principles for this uh, 3D visual systems. Uh, classified as either uh, passive systems or active uh, systems. I will talk mainly about the uh, 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 passive systems. The 3D image is acquired by mixing two image horizontally and then passively separated them into uh, polarized 3D glasses. This is the principle used in current heads up display like in Unity uh, visual system. Uh, in active system, the 3D image is obtained by showing high-speed uh, consecutive images from uh, for the right and left eye alternately, while a special pair of electronic glasses actually suppress the image in the other eye. And this is the principle used in the most head mounted uh, systems. Here, I'm going to talk uh, to talk uh, mainly about the true vision 3D and in Unity. And uh, there are many types of the head mountain uh, uh, 3D uh, visual system. The True Vision 3D system uh, in cataract surgery was firstly reported uh, by the Vance talk in 2010 in the Oscars meeting in Boston, who presented a retrospective analysis comparing the cataract surgery using a standard binocular microscope with a microscopic uh, equipped with a True Vision 3D system. And Venstek uh, uh, reported an excellent outcomes in both groups with minimal procedure time difference between the two groups. And uh, the interesting thing in, he notes that the rate of unplanned vitrectomy was three ti uh, times higher in the standard microscope uh, uh, compared with the true vision group. Here is the... Uh, a true vision uh, 3D surgical system, which is com uh, consists of a camera unit that attaches to a standard surgical microscope, sending stereoscopic images and video to a 3D high definition large screen monitor set in uh, about a few feet from the surgeon, providing a good visualization in uh, real time. 
and this machine was approved by the uh, United States FDA and has uh, granted clearance for refractive cataract toolset and application that provide 3D uh, graphical overlays for image uh, guided cataract surgery. Another uh, recently True Vision has um, developed that true guide and true plan applications, which have been designed for intelligent uh, surgical planning to aid in achieving target refractive outcomes, including the use of the toric IOL implantation for the cataract uh, surgery. And the one study, uh, Solomon reported the result of toric IOL implantation using true guide. Uh, he found that the eye, uh, about 83% of eyes were corrected uh, with uh, less than 0.5 diopter of astigmatism and uh, 100 patients were corrected with uh, less than one diopter of astigmatism and the uh, best corrected vision, it was 20-20 in 80% and uh, better than 2025 in 100% of the patient. Here is the uh, components of the uh, Ingenuity 3D visualization system, which uh, produced by the Alcon, uh, which consists of a 3D 4K flat panel display screen and 3D high dynamic range camera connected to the surgical microscope uh, with a 3D image processing computer and the console to store the 3D glasses and the cables and other accessories. There are many published papers uh, comparing between the uh, rate of complication and the duration of the time using the uh, 3D visual system. In this retrospective uh, uh, big study, uh, which all, all, all the surgery performed by one surgeon, uh, uh, there are uh, 2,320 eyes involved in this uh, study in two groups, 1,673 in 3D visual system who had cataract surgery with, uh, using the 3D visual system and um, 647 using the uh, traditional surgical microscope. In this uh, study, they evaluate the uh, posterior capsule rupture and vitreous loss along with that uh, duration time for the cataract surgery. And uh, it found that uh, there were no statistical significant difference in both complication rate and duration time of the cataract surgery. And it was um, similar efficacy and safety for the uh, traditional uh, surgical um, microscope. Another published uh, paper, uh, which is a prospective randomized uh, study comparing uh, also uh, the 3D visual system and traditional surgical microscope in 20 eyes, they evaluate the surgical time. And here also the best corrected visual acuity and the uh, corneal endothelial cell density. Uh, they found that uh, the best corrected visual acuity was uh, significantly improved in both group and there were no difference in surgical time and also in the corneal endothelial cell density in both group. And they concluded that the 3D visual systems are suitable and safer for the FICO IOL surgery. Here also using the 3D uh, visual system uh, using low light intensity condition in different type of uh, ocular surgery, not only for the cataract. There were 72 eyes involved in the, uh, the surgery, 60 eyes for cataract surgery alone and uh, seven eyes combined um, Cataract surgery with glaucoma micro device implant surgery, five eyes combined cataract with vitrectomy surgery, and uh, two eyes with only vitrectomy using uh, the dimer uh, illumination set through the microscope. And uh, it's found that all the surgery were completed without any complications under the low illumination condition. Uh, back to my experience in this field, uh, actually, I have tried the, the Ingenuity uh, 3D visual system in April 2018. I have operated the 10 cases only, uh, FACO emulsification with IOL implantation. Uh, it was a unique experience for the first time. I don't find any difficulty in dealing with the 3D depth of both cataract and anterior chamber. And um, uh, I found also a good handling with the instruments inside uh, the eye. Here, um, uh, I'm implanting the IOL using the 3D and Unity uh, visual system. I found also that performing all steps with 
heads up, which really makes your back and your neck much better than traditional way, as no more upper neck pain and no, no more strain, uh, as you feel um, usually after doing the surgery under the uh, traditional uh, surgical um, microscope. Uh, also, while doing the surgery uh, using the 3D visual system, I prefer to use the temporal approach um, rather than the uh, sitting uh, superiorly or the superior approach, as you can face the uh, panel screen directly, no need to turn your face to look at the screen. There were no complications in all my cases, and also I don't find any difference in the post-op results regarding the clarity of the cornea, IOL centration, and the best corrected visual acuity. In this, some pictures, I don't uh, record any videos. Uh, you can see in the first picture, uh, removing the uh, cortex through the screen, and in the second one, uh, doing the stromal hydration uh, uh, for the paracentesis and the third one, uh, the stromal hydration for uh, the main phago incision. The advantages and limitations for the 3D visual systems, especially for the ingenuity, uh, the potential advantages include similar surgical time, complication rate compared to the conventional microscope and decreased power of endo illuminator which can lead to reduce the phototoxicity and it's easy to use the uh, in, in uncommon situations, including severe uh, key forces, there are some limitations as um, difficult logistics, uh, the bulky machine inside the OR room, the cost of this machine and the assistant discomfort and difficulty to uh, use this machine, especially if the patient uh, moves his head during the surgery. And also in case there is um, media obesity, uh, there are uh, poor review. And thank you for attention. Thank you, Dr. Hassan. Excellent, excellent presentation. Uh, definitely, the it's just something really interesting that is happening. And I would like um, some audience to to we can take some questions, or if not, we can just continue. And of course, we have on the co-moderators, Dr. Sandeep, or anybody would like to add at this point. Then, of course, uh, I do see uh, right there, Dr. Sandeep is there. Yeah. So yeah. Um, uh, regarding the use of 3D system in anterior segment, I think the big problem here is that a phaco emulsification, uh, it takes a very short time to finish. But for a corneal transplant uh, surgery where, or a, a lamellar surgery, uh, for example, uh, deep lamellar surgery, if you can combine this with uh, with the OCT, uh, this will be a big a big advantage uh, because uh, in in those cases probably uh, 3D system really helps because you need to see the depth. Uh, so I think uh, for a corneal surgeon or a DMAC surgeon, I think it's a great uh, a great useful tool. Uh, but for just for a phaco emulsification, I don't think it's a uh, it's going to be an investment you would like to do. Thank you, Dr. Sandeep. Uh, now uh, it's time uh, to introduce, uh, if I can take the next 15 minutes, just introducing Dr. Aik Ahmed. He is a great human being, uh, an internationally uh, accredited teacher. I would call him somebody who has done more than any words can define uh, his area of anterior segment and glaucoma. So I would like to give this, uh, uh, this my opportunity to introduce him. Dr. Aik Ahmed would be taking the next talk on challenging cases. Please go ahead. Assalamualaikum, Hayat. Assalamualaikum to everybody, uh, brothers and sisters uh, around the world, and especially in uh, Dubai and UAE. It's a pleasure to, uh, to be with you all. I, I very much enjoyed all the presenters that spoke today. Um, I think uh, the presentations were top class. Dr. Shakin Kerry, I really much enjoyed your talk on microsphere of uh, and Dr. Uh, Safar and Dr. Khaled did a wonderful job on 3D, which I'm excited about, but I also share the same questions that exist. And I think we'll see more technology going forward. And of course, my good friend, uh, Hayat, uh, Hayat Khan, um, who himself is a wonderful human being and a great heart. Uh, thank you for, uh, for having me as part of this. And thank you for inviting me uh, to this uh, to this great conference, which I know is uh, is a very big conference. I'm I'm here in Toronto, and it's been a long time since I've been 
into the Gulf region. I look forward to uh, to visiting. So I chose my talk to talk about uh, some challenging uh, situations during uh, cataract surgery, and I felt that it would be uh, perhaps uh, useful to focus a bit on uh, on the iris. Um, there's many different ways to talk about challenging cases, and in 15 minutes, it's uh, difficult to cover all of this. So I thought I would focus on an area that has been a passion for mine, uh, that is often, um, you know, uh, coincident with complex uh, anterosegment reconstructions, whether it's corneal or lenticular in nature. And these are my disclosures um, that uh, I'd like to declare here. Of course, uh, these patients, uh, I believe, are often neglected uh, in our ophthalmic world um, with the photophobia phobia that exists, uh, the cosmetic appearance, which can be quite disfiguring to the patient, I think is sometimes ignored um, because the patients may still have reasonable vision. Um, but the self-esteem and the impact on how society views the patient and how they view society is greatly impacted, whether we agree or not, by the appearance of the pupil and the appearance of the eye. And to our patients, this is often more disabling than the actual visual acuity itself, which may be surprising to us as ophthalmic surgeons. Um, and merely reconstructing the pupil uh, can be of significant uh, quality of life improvement to our patients where they feel they can live a, a more normal life. And so the opportunity to do this and to repair it, I think is a great opportunity for us to try and help our patients. However, these are difficult and challenging cases and they require not only the technique, but also the artistic nature of what we do to address the appearance of the pupil. And we try to look and see whether we can utilize existing tissue or whether a prosthesis may be required. We see whether the capsular bag may be used uh, as a carrier for prosthesis or whether we need to suture a prosthesis in, or we do a combination of approaches. Now, there are a variety of prosthesis which are not always available, and there is an expense to this, but the mortar uh, prosthesis are the least uh, of the expensive uh, type of implants. And these are designed, these ones I'm showing here are designed to be placed in the capsular bag as modified rings to cover iris defects, whether they're diffuse or sectoral. There are also aniridia um, lenses, as you see here in the bottom right, suture to the sclera, which have a central optic that can be used. Certainly the innovation of the human optics implant, which is a beautiful implant uh, that can be placed in the capsular bag or sutured in the sulcus, uh, really takes it to the next level. And the ability to customize these uh, prosthesis to the patient's eye color can be fantastic. This patient has congenital aniridia and cataract. And you can see I've done the left eye already and we're doing the right eye next. And you, I told the patient, you can pick any color iris you want from a magazine and we can put it in your eye. That's what we did. And this is the prosthesis here. And you can see uh, in this case, it was a toric lens with this cataract and aniridia. And just to forward, we put, the lens, we put the lens in the capsular bag and we put the prosthesis into the capsular bag as well. We trefine it down. I typically do about a nine to 10 millimeter um, implant into the capsular bag, typically a little bit larger if it's not in the capsular bag in the sulcus. And if it's in the sulcus, we always suture it down, but it's quite really a nice, uh, a nice cosmetic result as you can see uh, for this patient. However, I will say that I primarily like to suture as much as I can. I think the ability to do this in a more budget uh, friendly way and also can result in very good cosmetic results. There are a variety of ways to allow us to suture the iris. And I encourage us all to learn the different approaches that can be out there, including the standard mechanical, which is the classical approach. One thing to remember is that it's very helpful to have the right instrumentation. And here's a couple of tips using different hooks. Kuglin, Sinsky hooks are important. And I do think having the right micro instrumentation are helpful. And nowadays with micro instrumentation in the vitroretinal and anterior segment space, we have the availability of these tools in our toolbox, which are very handy. I use micro graspers and micro scissors a lot. I use micro tires to tie suture in the eye and they are smooth tip platforms. These are specially designed, but really one can use a variety of different uh, instrumentations that are available. And these are very handy to be able to do it. So one of the uh, most common approaches and uh, that is easy to remember, hopefully, uh, is, uh, is Mick Ahmed. My fellows named this one. Uh, basically we pass the needle. This is typically a tenopolypropylene suture. 
I should have mentioned that earlier, that the suture we use is 10O polypropylene for most cases. This is on a CIF4 needle. Um, and what we do basically, we pass the needle through the iris tissue, uh, coming out through the main incision. We then bring the free end out uh, through the anterior chamber, out through the main incision. This is simple to do. We then wrap around the long end of the suture around the micro tire and grab the short end and pull it through. And then we push the, uh, the short end into the eye. This is sliding the nut into the eye. And now we have a cinch down. Some of you have heard about the four throw pupoplasty technique that uh, Amar Agarwal had popularized and that can be used with the same approach. Uh, and I like to throw one additional locking knot, however. And then there's intraocular tying techniques, which we designed many years ago, which can be used to suture, in this case, suturing an iris uh, implant to the iris, the eye well to the iris as well, it can be done. So this patient here is an example. You can see the uh, iris defect present in a patient of Sudafake who had uh, significant iris prolapse due to uh, floppy iris syndrome. And although there's missing iris, you can see we're basically stretching in the iris and we're seeing that the iris is quite elastic. The placement of incisions are very important. We strategically placed these incisions so we can take advantage of the long curved needle that can be placed here using the assistance of the micro forcep to grab the iris. And this is very much like passing sutures, but in the eye, of course, it requires really good spatial awareness and maneuvering of our, of our fingers and twirling of our fingers um, with uh, passing the needle through the eye without grabbing the cornea and without putting traction on the iris, which could cause a larger buttonhole. We take the Kuglin hook and we basically pull the, uh, the sutures uh, out of the main incision. And then we can now tie the suture outside the eye. I have a tying forcep in one hand and a micro tie in the other hand. This is the Mick Ahmed, as I said. It's like the mechanical, that's why they called it Mick in there, but we're basically using a micro uh, forcep to wrap around the uh, long end and push the short end into the eye. To me, this is one of the most uh, uh, straightforward techniques to, to learn. And it's basically helpful to control the passing of these sutures here with these micro instruments. And now you can see we basically have brought the iris together. We'll bring the suture out of the eye again. And I like to knot the eye. I'd like to put a knot in the suture. I just find it to be more secure and less concerning about it slipping and loosening later on postoperatively, especially if the tension is somewhat high. So we basically are gonna pass multiple sutures here through the iris defect and close it. There's three sutures that are gonna be placed in the defect here. And this is not one surgery to basically rush through the case. Uh, we wanna really you know, carefully pass sutures, avoid making TI defects and buttonholing the iris because that can cause translumination defects and a problem. Now the pupil is looking better, but we're not happy because we wanna get that pupil to be nice and round and to our patients, one of the most important aspects of a normal looking eye is a, a round center pupil. We take great effort to do this. And this means having a critical eye to imagine and visualize where the iris tissue is coming together. I'm gonna to remove this little strand of iris there. And now I'm gonna show you the intraocular tying technique, which is a little bit more involved using two micro tires in the eye. And this is really the importance to teach surgeons about using the fulcrum, using the incisions as a fulcrum and really avoiding pushing and pulling the eye and letting our fingers do the work by twirling in our fingertips. Uh, this is the true art of microsurgery in the eye. And we do this with cataract surgery in some ways, but it's important that we uh, adhere to the principles of micro closed system surgery uh, by doing these, te these techniques techniques. So now micro scissors used. And so you can see at the end of the case, we have a reasonably uh, centered pupil that's round. And you can see that postoperatively the result of this patient that is now difficult to tell the difference when you see the patient at a distance. One of the things that I like to do is use uh, iris cautery, uh, iris endodiathermy for pupiloplasty. This allows us to uh, modify the iris position. In this case, for example, we have corectopia and we have a decentered pupil and we'll, what we'll do is we'll pass a suture to approximate the pupil there. Remember that this is an art in progress. What we see right now is not gonna be the final outcome as you'll see. We're basically bringing the iris tissue together to allow uh, the pupil to reform. And then we're gonna watch, I'm using my endodiathermy bipolar here to reshape and draw the iris here more superiorly. 
and this will again uh, bring the reposition the iris and the pupil more centrally. We'll continue to pass sutures in as the techniques I showed earlier, tie in the suture, close the defect. And again, take, a, take time to get that pupil more centered by making one additional pass here. But the pupil looks still a little bit uh, irregular. You can see the straight edge there. So place the cautery, the farther away from the edge of the pupil, the greater effect you have, the less effect you have. So start more conservatively. And you can see we have a reasonably round pupil at the end of the case that looks uh, fairly consistent. And we can do a lot of work. This is actually a, a pupil cerclage that was done as well. Uh, finally, this is, a take, this, is a, this is a patient who has a very large aerodialysis with a cataract. And we will uh, take care of the cataract first. We're going to place some iris hooks to keep the iris away uh, from the field. Vision blue, capsule rexus. The eye well goes in the bag after routine cataract surgery. And then we can now address uh, the, uh, the pupil. In this case, you'll see that there's a large, almost five clock hour aerodialysis. And we will try to smoothen out the iris. It's good to get to these cases within the two, three months of the trauma to avoid fibrosis and too much tinnitus. We don't have to go right away, but we'll do it within two, three months. And now we're gonna make a groove just behind the blue zone uh, of the limbal area. And in this case, we're using a straight STC6 needle. And this is the best needle we like to use for analysis. And we're gonna place mattress sutures. Now there's a variety of portraits that have been used, including the sewing machine technique. I like to use interrupted sutures like this, mattress sutures. I'm docking the suture with a 27 gauge needle. And we have to approximate. Remember the arc length or the circumference of the iris is gonna be shorter than the arc length or the circumference on the sclera. So take wider space between the suture bites as you go out of the eye than in the eye. And this will allow the iris to spread over that circumference. And uh, we basically wanna grab a bite just from the, in the peripheral aspect of the iris. And so, the idea is now to, 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 tie, to pass multiple sutures here. I'm not going to tie the suture. I'm going to put a slip knot because we have to finalize the uh, tension after we place the additional suture bite. So do a slip knot as you see here. And this allows us to titrate the tension nicely. You can see I'm approximating where to put the iris next. And I'm going to place another mattress suture there and there. And we have one se a second mattress placed and we tie the suture there again. And a third mattress is placed here to allow us to close that, that defect. Now the iris is looking better, isn't it? We're happy with it, but you know what? Don't stop. The pupil is still atonic and dilated. We, can, we, we repaired the dialysis, but we have not repaired the pupil. So we have to repair the pupil. So here's what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take a CIF4 needle and we're gonna repair the iris, the pupil. And we're gonna use a, a, a running um, uh, cerclage overlapping technique by bringing the iris to the needle. And this allows us to really nicely uh, create a nice round pupil. We're gonna do this in four passes, going across the, uh, the uh, quarter of the eye here, and then we'll go double arm to this way. It's helpful to use both hands, be ambidextrous. And you can see the bit of traction that's placed here. So we're gonna have to adjust that. And we go all the way around, all the way around, and then we're gonna tie our suture again, like the McGombard approach, bring it into the eye, and lock the knot what we're happy with the, with the size. You can see I'm putting some traction here so I can adjust the knot here at the end. It's okay not to do it very tight. As long as it's close to the angle, you can hang it back a little bit. And we finalize the, the suture here and we're done. And we have a nice round pupil. So those are many of the techniques that I want to share with you. And I know there's lots to discuss. Uh, so much is available online. And I look forward always to communicating with some of you on Instagram or Facebook or YouTube. That's the way we've been able to keep in touch uh, these days uh, during the pandemic and, uh, and keeping us together uh, and keep on learning. So thank you for the invitation again, and I appreciate the, uh, the honor of being here. Thank you, I, I think we have time, a lot of time to uh, ask many questions for all the speakers. Anyone from the moderator, Dr. Sandeep or Dr. Passan, Dr. Hayat? I think I will ask first uh, Dr. Ike. Did you find any difficulty to dilate the pupil if we need to dilate this pupil if you are doing circum all circum uh, cornea? This is all the, the suture all around the pupil. Uh, if the patient needs to be dilated for any treatment, laser treatment, or even to examine the fundus? Yes, I mean, of course, depending on the size we make it, that's going to be the size if it's a circumferential cerclage. If it's a small 
closure, you know, locally, then you can dilate the rest of the pupil. So we typically like to need the pupil about three and a half millimeters. This is the best size for photophobia. My retina colleagues aren't always happy, but really with the wide angle viewing systems uh, and with indentation ophthalmoscopy, this is generally still achievable. Now, of course, if it's a very bad diabetic or something, then I think it's better to leave the pupil larger. And if it's worst case scenario, we can cut the, uh, the suture and the pupil will dilate if necessary. So we haven't really had a major issue, but I know I hear this question and I would be cautious, of course, in a high risk patient, but um, if necessary, you can always cut the suture and three and a half millimeters, you can, should be able to do a good peripheral examination. Uh, although I know it's somewhat more challenging. Dr. Araki, uh, first of all, thank you very much. It's uh, wonderful to hear from you about the repair of uh, iris. Uh, just one question. Have you uh, approached patients with uh, essential iris atrophy? Uh, where have you, uh, what sort of uh, approach you take there? Because the iris is very friable in these patients. Yeah, if the iris is very friable, I don't think they're amenable to suturing, and especially uh, if it's a proliferative condition like essential iris atrophy or eye syndrome or other conditions like this, I prefer not to touch the iris. In those cases, I typically go to iris prosthesis. Uh, you know, preferably in the capsule or bag if we can, or sutured if necessary. But those are trickier ones. I don't like to suture those. And it's important to remember the difference between the uh, pathological iris conditions where we're using prosthesis, where we remove iris, versus the cosmetic iris implants, right? We don't, we don't like cosmetic iris implants. These things are sitting on top of the iris. They cause lots of problems. But these um, specifically medically indicated iris prosthesis is, are different. We're putting them in conditions not in the anterior chamber, we're putting them in the posterior chamber and in the capsular bag often. Uh, the, the problem with IC syndrome is that many of them have poor endothelial count as well. And mm -hmm. um, in these cases, putting a prosthesis, of course, um, do you think they, they have any risk of progressing with their endothelial problem or in the bag, they're fine? I, I wouldn't do it alone. I mean, if you're doing, if, if you're doing cataract surgery, if you're doing cataract surgery, then I think it's useful to combine it with a prosthesis in the bag. I don't believe the endothelial cell loss will be any greater than with the FACO. But to do it just for the purposes of repairing the iris, no, I, I wouldn't do it for that purpose. I think that I agree with you. I think there's too many risks. I would only do it if I was combining with cataract surgery in that example. Thank you, Dr. Aiki. That was great. Uh, yes, uh, I have a comment regarding the correctopia patients, I mean, I do see a lot of pediatric patients, uh, young patients coming with just nothing but just correctopia, bilateral sometimes, and the parents are really worried. I think this opens up a whole, especially the cauterization, which with which actually you can beautify. It's a kind of a stigma a lot of patients do have. If you see on their uh, personality, you can talk about it, then you'll know. It would actually improve a lot of not only cosmetic, but the whole personality. And thank you, Dr. Ike, for this kind of uh, presentation, which uh, makes us think as a how we can help these patients, which we were earlier just telling them, well, we have nothing else to offer. Um, regarding the microspherophakia, I have uh, Dr. Ike, I have uh, Dr. Nihal, I mean, they, they both have huge numbers. Um, I do have sometimes patients where uh, one eye has corneal opacities because sometimes it's completely subluxated, while the other eye is a good eye, which has no cataract and is a better seeing eye. And one day they come with an anterior subluxation. Uh, I have tried doing pilocopin and putting it back. Uh, what is your take? Would we take out that lens or would you just leave it for then? Good question for me, Hayat. Yes, uh, one by one, you and Dr. Ike. Well, I think once you have a microspherophakia, uh, you know that I did maybe hundreds of cases of microspherophakia, and I saw many cases nearly every month. Uh, I think once you diagnose it, I think it has to be removed. There is no role of uh, closing the pupil over it. It will not prevent the complications and it will definitely go into either posterior dislocation or anterior dislocation or any type of glaucoma. And I have many patients blind because of delayed diagnosis and delayed treatment. So the best thing is to remove it. Number one, you're gonna treat the high myopia 
which is also embryogenic. And I usually see minus 15 and minus 20 uh, myopia. And it is a lenticular myopia, actually. And we see very high astigmatism, which is also embryogenic. And apart from this, you see the, the, there is a high rate of anterior dislocation. And sometimes when the patient refused to go for surgery, it dislocate posteriorly and then anteriorly and then end with uh, joint retinal tears and retinal detachment, which is very difficult to, to repair later on. So I think there is no role of any peripheral iridectomy or glaucoma surgery or uh, pupillary constriction. And the only line of treatment is to remove uh, the lens. Dr. Aik, would you like to add yeah, I completely agree. I, I, I think it's a wonder, pr wonderful presentation from uh, Dr. Shek and Kerry. I really enjoyed it. And I completely agree. This is a surgical issue. And I, I do see, unfortunately, misdiagnosis. And I see uh, PIs done with uh, further IOP problems. I see TRABs done with complications there. And I think these should be handled by an expert surgeon, as we saw uh, from Dr. Shek and Kerry's uh, talk. Um, you know, sometimes they're subtle. I mean, they're extreme examples. Sometimes they're subtle. And sometimes they present later on as well in patients that are older. And so always have your, you know, your uh, antenna up when you see somebody with high myopia and someone who has a normal axial length and their keratometry is otherwise routine. Um, you know, I deal with a little bit older population, uh, you know, patients who are a little bit older. And, you know, I, I tend to use uh, a lot of capsular tension rings and segments and suturing them and everything, all the, all the gymnastics, which I don't know if I can tell you that the outcomes are any better or not, but that's the way I have typically dealt with it is to retain the capsular bag and use capsular tension segments and rings and suture them to the sclera and put IOLs in bags. But this is obviously a good uh, controversial discussion, especially when it comes to very young patients where I agree that uh, the IOL is not necessarily the right answer, but with their older patients, you know, in my, in my example, you know, we have four, three, four, five, six year old and older patients, I quite often will do that. I'll do a posterior capsular rexus and a buttonhole with the IOL. And it's a lot of work, but uh, I think it might be another option. Uh, well, actually, concerning intraocular lenses, maybe this is feasible for cases of ectopia lentis. But micro spherophakia, the lens, the, the diameter of the capsular bag is small. And even if you suture it to the, if you put capsule, capsule attention ring or suture it to the sclera, the capsular bag is small. It will not accommodate the usual intraocular lens. So in cases, if you're going to leave the child aphakic because the age doesn't permit you to implant intraocular lens, we, we, there is no role of leaving uh, capsular supports. As you saw, all cases go to a shrinkage of the capsular bag and opacification of the visual axis. And we had to remove this uh, bag at a later uh, date. But if we tend to implant, I prefer the iris glow lens because the capsular bag originally is small. There is no run. Maybe it is feasible and possible to implant intraocular lens and use CTRs if it is not micro. It is not uh, microphakia. It's a sort of a subluxated lens. I think it's going to be a wise decision to go for intraocular lens. Yeah, it's a it's a good debate. I'll tell you, I have many eyes that are eight millimeter diameters uh, and even six millimeter diameters, and a CTR will expand the bag. And a nice foldable lens will fit with the haptics compressed and the bag spread. I do lots of LEC cleaning with capsular polishing. Uh, we have a large series, but I agree if this bag is really small, if it's four or five millimeters or smaller, it's a problem. So there's probably a limit to that, but I think you can actually, believe it or not, for a bag that's maybe seven, eight, nine millimeters in size, uh, which isn't extreme, I agree, if it's extreme, um, then you can't. But I agree, if you can't put a CTR and CTR it in, then there's no role for an IO in the bag. That's really interesting and uh, very nice opinions from all part of the world. Thank you so much, Dr. Aik Yamad. Thank you, Dr. Nihal. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Dr. Hassan. Dr. Prasan Rao, would you like to add something? So I'm in awe with all the videos and amazing uh, photographs from Dr. Nihal and uh, Dr. Aik. As usual, these videos are amazing. Uh, I think he's more a uh, ocular plastic surgeon the intraocular plastic surgeon, I would say. Amazing results with his iris uh, corrections. As a retinal surgeon, uh, uh, we do have cases where we have uh, Toma patients who have iris problems. Our main aim is just to fix the retina, and I think uh, Dr. Aik is doing a wonderful job of uh, fixing the iris. Uh, thank you for your excellent videos. Thank you for everyone. Any other question from anyone? 
So, Doctor Aik, uh, since you have used uh, uh, just one one quick question, uh, since you use both Ingenuity and the RT Pro, do you find any difference between them, or uh, both seem similar? Well, we're doing a study on this. Um, I, I think they're both good systems. I mean, obviously, the Artivo is built from the ground up for 3D uh, with two 4K cameras uh, and a little bit more resolution. Uh, the latency is, is, is less, uh, but it's very hard to perceive the, the differences. Um, you know, so I think, I think they're both good systems. But I will say the Artivo is basically built, so it's very easy to go back and forth, and, and it's designed with the optics in mind for this. Um, but, uh, you know, we're doing a study, to be honest with you. So we have both systems and we'll, we'll see what they show. It's interesting, though, it's hard to show differences, as you saw from the, from the presentations today. Um, and so, you know, th these are where we talk about surgeon preference, posture, and uh, image, image uh, manipulation, and surgical guidance, which I think is the future. Any experience with the bionic uh, eye? Yeah, Bionics also has, a, as you know, a, a, you know a, a, a headset display, and I've used it in, uh, in a non-clinical setting. So this is also very exciting where you have a VR setup and you have gesture control and you can look at your OCT, look at everything you want, and you can move it around and you have everything in front of you. Um, so that's fascinating. I think it's, it's potential something that may also come. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, everybody and their toys. Thank yeah. you for everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you I think very much. We, yeah, we come to the end of this session and the end of this day. I thank everyone. I especially thank Dr. Mohammed. And tomorrow, inshallah, it will we will start in the afternoon our uh, virtual uh, meeting. Thank you for everyone. Thank you. Take care. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you so thank much. You, Stay everyone. safe. Thanks a lot. Thank, thank you, everyone. Bye bye. Thank you.